I clicked it. <laughs> okay, so today, um, digestive. And hopefully you submitted your work so you can get your points. Uh, and then, of course, if you typed it, you probably want to print it out so you can bring it with you guys next Thursday, right, for the test in the Hibernia Center. So, um, digestive. So, what are the main functions um, of the components of our upper digestive tract, right? And then we're going to talk about what role um, your liver has in both health and disease. So, for your reproductive tract, it's also given other names that you should be familiar with. Um, so, elementary canal or um, gastrointestinal tract, right? All right. What? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so your upper digestive is pretty much your stomach up, right? And, and in general, anyways, what's the purpose of your digestive system? Right, break down uh, food and absorb food to provide nutrients to the body. And so your mouth right, starts the breaking down of that food, not only physically, right, with the chewing and the breaking down with your teeth, but also enzymatically by the saliva that you produce, actually starts breaking down um, starches and um, sugars. And then your esophagus is literally just a tube that leads to the stomach, right? And your stomach is where, what type of digestion happens, anyone know? Protein, yep. Protein and some fat digestion um, happens um, in your stomach. And then the rest of the digestion happens in the small intestine, as well as the absorption of those nutrients that are necessary. But one of the things that you'll notice about your digestive system linked to it that aid in digestion are both your liver and your pancreas, um, and they're connected by ducts to the um, small intestines, right at the beginning of the small intestines, known as the duodenum, right? Good old A and P days. Are you good? <laughs> so um, it's linked because the liver produces bile, um, uh, which contains substances like bile salts that aid in the digestion of fats. And then the pancreas produces several um, enzymes that aid in digestion of your, of your food, as well as alkaline buffers, because your stomach produces acid for protein digestion, um, and we've got to neutralize that acid when it gets to the small intestine. So, um, unfortunately, because of that linkage, pathogens can travel from the gut up into the pancreas via the ducts, um, and also into the liver. Um, and then your gallbladder uh, stores excess bile produced by your liver, right? Your liver actually produces the bile. Um, anything that doesn't actually go into the small intestine, when those um, little sphincters are closed that open up and allow bile to go into the small intestine, when they're closed, the bile that's produced by the liver backs up and goes into the gallbladder and get stored. So you have this extra um, storage of bile. And so when you um, eat a really fatty meal and you need more bile, that's when that organ contracts and extra, extra bile goes into the small intestines. Um, but that, like I said, this can create a, a problem though in that this can be a place um, where infection can go from the intestines. It can travel up that duct um, into the liver and even into the gallbladder. And the bad news with the gallbladder is that it is just a sac, right, that's, that's storing um, extra bile. Um, and so if, if stuff gets in there, our immune system can't get to it, right? The good news is that a lot of microbes, the bile salts are inhibitory to them actually growing. The bad news is that some microorganisms can grow in the presence of bile salts. Um, 
salmonella for one. Uh, so uh, I want to make sure I get through our, all the important stuff in this lecture. So I'm going to save some of my favorite stories for you guys until the end of the lecture today. Uh, although I'd like, I wish I could talk about it now. But I want to make sure I get uh, through it all. So for your liver, as I said, aids in digestion. So really important for that fat digestion is the bile that's produced by your liver but stored in your gallbladder. Um, and so this also not only just fats, but a lot of our vitamins are fat soluble, right? We can't absorb them without um, this ability to be able to absorb fats. So your vitamins A, D, E, and K, um, their absorption is very dependent on bile uh, and bile salts. Your liver helps neutralize um, poisons. Um, and, and in truth, whenever you take a medication, your liver considers it um, a poison. <laughs> and it breaks it down um, and, and um, over time. And then uh, your body then excretes it by filtering it out of your blood uh, by your kidneys into your urine. Right? And so that's why, too, if people have had damage, to their liver or to their kidney, it can affect uh, how medications work for them and, and how medications affect them. Um, so that, that can be a serious consequence. And there are some medications that you'll hear too, um, you have to have liver tests done if you're on this medication because there's the potential that the medication can da cause damage to the liver. And your liver is very important for um, purifying out these toxins from your blood. And breaking them down. It also removes uh, a product of the breakdown of your red blood cells, right? Your um, hemoglobin, that protein component, um, and it breaks it down into uh, a yellowish pigment, which is usually put into the bile, right? And it's one of the reasons why um, bile has the color that it does. It actually ends up being green because of other pigments. Um, that get associated with it. Um, if your liver is not functioning, is not breaking down um, this um, pigment, um, if you have a buildup of what's referred to, this pigment's referred to as bilirubin, right? Um, this yellow pigment, pigment, if it's not being filtered out of the blood, it will stay in, just in circulation. Um, so because of that, um, certain areas of the body will become this yellowish tinge. So people's skin, especially babies, because their liver isn't quite up to par when they're first born for being able to um, recycle this uh, pigment quickly, they'll, they'll get what's referred to as jaundice, right, where they have yellowing to their skin. One of the easy ways to help with that, especially for a baby, is just uh, UV light, taking them outside and exposing them um, to being outside in, in natural light. Um, and then sometimes if it's severe enough, uh, they'll do it in a hospital or they literally expose it to UV light for certain periods of time to help break down that pigment in the skin. Now for some individuals, the, the buildup can be so severe that it's like this picture you see here where they actually have the yellow pigmentation to the whites of their eyes. And I've seen this firsthand. It was pretty scary. The first time I saw it, I didn't know, right? I was beginning student. <laughs> I didn't know why a patient would have yellow eyes, you know. It really freaked me out. I was working at a doctor's office and said to the nurse, I'm like, what's wrong with that guy? And she's like, oh, he's in liver failure. He had had a liver transplant um, and it was failing. His transplant was failing. Um, he was also an alcoholic. That's how he lost his first liver and was probably why the second one was failing as well, which you know, that's a whole nother issue right there, right? Um, it's sad more than anything. I found, I found, I, you know, it was very sad. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that your liver is failing. It means that your liver isn't doing its job. So there are, are there other ways in which, you know, your liver could be affected and it be temporary and not permanent? So why, why would you be... Now, for a little kid, right, for an infant, it's the liver isn't up to par yet. But 
Do you guys know of any other conditions where people would become jaundiced potentially because their liver function has been affected? Cirro cir cirrhosis, right? So um, infection of the liver, right? So anyone know any particular diseases that affect the liver? Hepatitis, yep. No, no, that's stomach. Um, malaria, which we don't talk much about here. One other one transmitted by a mosquito. Again, we don't worry about it here, but in other countries. It's actually named after the fact that you tend to look yellow. Yellow fever. Yellow fever, right? Again, affects the liver. That virus affects the liver, so hence causes jaundice, causes you to be yellow, and that's actually where that one got its name. Um, the problem with malaria is the destruction of red blood cells as well as it can affect the liver uh, and, and affects the liver. Um, there are some times, too, where there may be an infection that's causing a lot of destruction to red blood cells, so much so that the liver just can't keep up with the amount of hemoglobin that it's having to recycle at that time. So it doesn't always mean the worst case scenario, right? Your liver is failing, dying, you know. Um, it could be a disease, say, it could be temporary. Um, but it's obviously something is going wrong, right? And, and the problem is, is the liver isn't able to keep up with this um, recycling of this pigment, bilirubin, from your red blood cells. So your liver is very important to your health, right? But, you know, it can, it can get diseased like anything else as well. Um, for your normal microbiota, right, so normal bacteria, um, yeast associated with your intestinal tract, how are they beneficial? Well, we've already talked about in our skin, right? How is it that um, bacteria that are already present, how do they help us out? What's beneficial about them already being there? They're eating the nutrients, right? And taking up the spot. So who doesn't get the spot? Bad bacteria, pathogens, right? It's what we call competitive exclusion, right? By them being there, it's less likely that a pathogen is going to be able to take up residence because they've already got the spot. They're already eating the food. And they'll even fight for that spot, right? They're like, this is my spot. <laughs> you can't have it, right? Um, so that just being there helps protect us. And the good news for the most part, as long as they stay where we've agreed their boundaries are, right? They're like, okay, you can stay in the large intestine. That's your spot. You can have it. Just don't leave there, right? Um, so the unfortunate thing is when they leave. Um, so um, they're an important part. Uh, and protecting the, ba the body from in invasion, right, by being there. Uh, the flora of our digestive tract are mainly found in our oral cavity and our intestines, speci more specifically the large intestine. So in our mouth, the unfortunate thing about our mouth is our teeth, right, provide an attachment site for microbes. And, and this, these normal guys mm, can cause problems, right? Um, because they can stick to the teeth. They can form a biofilm that we know is, as plaque, um, which you can't just rinse your mouth, right, and get that to go away. You got to floss. You got to brush. You got to do both. There's a, there's a saying that says, you know, which teeth should I floss? The ones you want to keep, right? So in other words, all of them, right? All of them. Um, and uh, for some of us, not our, our, our favorite thing to do, but it's an important um, thing if you want to keep your teeth. I don't know. And it's expensive for fake teeth, by the way. So, you know, you want to keep them. <laughs> if nothing else, right? <laughs> it encourage you monetarily wise, right? I'm still paying one of my dentists 
bills off, you know. Just give them my 20 bucks every month. <laughs> Eventually those thousands of dollars I owe will go away. <laughs> um, but uh, you definitely want to take care of your teeth. Uh, and um, so, but unfortunately they, they, they provide a surface for microbes um, to attach. And so the ones in our mouth that we really worry about are streptococcal species. Um, and we're going to talk about a, a little bit a little bit later uh, about how how they're um, damaging to us. So our our mucous membranes, right, in our mouth, we're continually shedding those epithelial cells, right. They're not sticking to our gums, right. They're not sticking to the inside of our mouth. They're sticking to our teeth, right. Um, and we need to uh, remove them and not let large amounts of them to build up. So then small intestines, um, small number of bacteria colonize the upper small intestine, mostly ones that are aerobic, some that are facultative anaerobes, um, lots of gram-negative um, bacilli, but also some streptococci. The largest number is in, of course, our large intestine. And pretty much when food gets to our large intestine, that's trash for us, okay? What we're going to digest, we've digested in the, the stomach and the small intestines. Anything that's not absorbed in the small intestines then goes into the large intestine. There, we still can do some absorption of nutrients, but we're not doing any more digestion. We personally are not digesting anything any further in our large intestines. So now it's food for the bacteria that live there. Right? So we're giving them our waste. We're like, here you go. You can have it. Right? This is what I didn't do anything with. Maybe you can do something with it. Right? And they do. And that's why they grow to such large numbers, so much so that one gram of, of feces, right, contains about a billion bacteria in it. Very large numbers of bacteria in your gut. And again, we have a symbiotic relationship with them. We feed them, we give them a place to live, and some of them even produce essential vitamins that we need, right? So this is a win-win mutualistic sharing opportunity. It's when these guys get places they're not supposed to go that we run into problems, right? So little girls, we have the problem that we have two holes very close to each other, right? the anus and the vagina, and the urethra, so three holes, right? Three hole problem. Um, bacteria from the intestines, if they were to get into the vagina or the urethra, they can enter into the body and cause serious problems, right? Little girl several years back in Louisiana died is something as that simple as not being taught how to properly wipe after defecating. Um, little girls and women are taught to wipe towards the back. You don't ever wipe forward because you don't want to bring bacteria from feces into the vagina or into the urethra. For her, it got up into the urethra, spread from the bladder all the way up to the ureters to her kidneys and shut down her kidneys and killed her. Right? Uh, it's not something to mess around with. And sometimes the guys tune me out, although I have to say you guys are paying attention. I'm impressed with you this morning. Um, because someday you might have to take care of a little girl, right, and teach her this. Um, and so it's not just mom's responsibility sometimes, it's dad's as well. Um, I have to say I'm glad I have a boy, though, right, because, you know, it's easy. Those holes are pretty far apart from each other. I mean, you have to do some really serious stuff to get poo that far, right? Uh, but it can be done, so you still have to explain, right, that poo is bad, <laughs> right? Um, and did I tell you guys my really grossed out story about a little kid in poo? About him eating his own poo? Okay, I already told you guys that. Okay, I'll, I'll spare you this morning. Um, your poo is okay. It's other people's poo you don't want to really necessarily come in contact with. Um, but yours is only okay if it goes in and the same system it just came out of. You don't want it getting into places it's not supposed to, like the vagina and the urethra, because it contains billions of bacteria, right? Um, and in the gut, we've got this symbiotic relationship going on, right? We got this synergy, this agreement, right, where it's okay. <laughs> it's when they get in other parts of our body that they start eating stuff they're not supposed to, right? 
and that's when they create problems. So as I said, they produce some really great vitamins for us. It's a list of several of the different ones. Uh, women that are pregnant too, you know, know that folic acid is extremely important. Um, it's been linked to proper fetal development. Um, and so they I, I suggest that you take extra of it, take a particular uh, vitamin when you're pregnant. Because uh, you don't produce it. You have to get it from your diet or the microbes in your gut have got to make it for you. Um, and depending on your diet and your microbial population, you may not be getting enough to then give it to someone else. When you're pregnant, right, you're not only just eating for you, you're eating for that child as well. You're supporting another life. And it's considered a life and a half. You eat your staple and then half another portion, not two portions, right? One and a half portions, right? People think, oh, I'm eating for two, right? I get to eat two times. Of no, one and a half. <laughs> one and a half. They're not a whole person yet, right? They're little. They don't need a whole portion of food. So one of the things that can really create problems for us is that, remember, that whole competitive exclusion. If those bacteria are in our gut, if our normal E. coli and our normal flora that inhabit the intestines are there, then if we do ingest something like salmonella, right, or uh, shigella, hopefully that it gets digested, or if there's a few of them left, there's so few, they can't out-compete our normal flora that are already in our intestines, and they go out the system, right? They don't have a parking spot. They don't have a niche, right? So they just get passed out the system. When we take antibiotics, though, does it just kill the pathogens? No, it kills all bacteria that that antibiotic can affect, right? So even if you take a narrow spectrum antibiotic where you take one that's just against gram negatives, right? You're going to still affect your normal flora that are gram negatives in your intestines. And depending on the extent of antibiotics that you take and what kind, especially if it's broad spectrum, then you're, you know, Broad spectrum means just about everybody's going to get targeted, right? You're, you could potentially debilitate that microbial population in your intestines to such a degree that you don't have that competitive exclusion anymore, right? You don't have enough bacteria in your gut. So when a bad guy comes along, and the most common offender that's going to cause this type of infection in your intestines, known as um, pseudomembranous colitis, and pseudomembranous, mean, meaning that um, it's a false membrane. And the scary thing about this organism, Clostridium difficile, is it produces toxins that literally destroy the cells of your intestines. Right? They cause um, death. And so they, they can create, you know, a whole sheet of death, right? So this pseudomembrane, it's not a functioning membrane, it's a dead membrane of cells in your in your large intestines. Very damaging um, condition. It's an anaerobic bacteria. It is a spore former, so again, we get exposed to it in the environment. You may ingest these spores, but normally they're not going to germinate because, again, the normal bacteria are going to outcompete them. But when you do things like take antibiotics and you completely debilitate that normal population in the intestines, when you ingest the spores, when they get to the large intestines, right, there are some areas that will be anaerobic. It can germinate. There's no one to compete with. He takes over and takes over in a bad way because, like I said, he produces toxins that will literally destroy the intestines. So then, you know, you've got to go on antibiotics to get rid of the Clostridium difficile which anyone who's worked in um, in a hospital setting already or a nursing home or something like that, Clostridium difficile smells really bad, right? That's one of the things, too, like poo smells bad to us in general, right? The products that microorganisms produce when they eat our food um, are not um, pleasing to us, right? And if you give them certain types of food, they'll even ferment it and produce gas, right? That's how we end up with flatulence, right? 
when you eat certain foods. So believe it or not, if you fart a lot, you probably need to change your diet if you don't want to continue to fart, right? Eat something different, feed your microbes something they're not going to ferment, right, and produce gas. Um, for this, one of the treatments as well is they've got to reestablish that microbial environment in the gut. So what they will do is do a fecal transplant. So somebody in your household, they'll stick their poo in your large intestines to try and reestablish that same microbial environment or similar environment that you had previously to reestablish. How exactly they do that, I do not know, but I know for a fact they do. <laughs> That's enough poo talk for now, right? <laughs> so let's go back to our mouths, right? So um, what's the difference between dental caries, and this isn't a misprint, um, dental cavities or caries, um, same, same thing. Uh, periodontal disease and, and trench mouth. So for dental cavities, the, the major offenders are Streptococcus mutans. Um, this particular uh, species of bacteria can again form um, biofilm and attach to the teeth. And this is why dentists don't like sugar, right? Because when you take table sugar, sucrose, good old table sugar, right, which is in everything nowadays, even things you wouldn't even imagine, right, <laughs> they put sugar in it, just like salt, <laughs> put it in everything, and gluten, <laughs> they're killing me. These bacteria break down that sugar and produce lactic acid. What does acid do to your teeth? It breaks it down. It deteriorates your teeth, right? And so that's why, like, if you're a sugaraholic like me, you just brush your teeth after you have the candy. It's all good, right? Don't leave that sugar sitting on your teeth. Don't feed those bacteria, right? Because you're giving them the ability to produce acid, to, and that deteriorates your teeth, right? And we only get one set of teeth, one set of adult teeth. Make sense? So that's the, that's the main pot problem with cavities, right? Why we have destruction of our teeth is the bacteria literally producing acid and deteriorating away our teeth. Periodontal disease is linked to cavities in a way in that plaque, right, these bacteria forming this biofilm sticking to your teeth, as that builds up, your gums, which hold your teeth in place, come in contact with these bacteria, right, that are stuck on your teeth. They get infected and inflamed. And if you have destruction of your gums, what happens? Eventually, you'll lose your teeth, right, because you have nothing to hold on to them with. Um, so again, you could lose the tooth itself and the integrity of the tooth if you don't get the plaque cleaned off. And if it continues, it will also even affect the gums that hold the teeth in place. So what's the best pre preventative for periodontal disease and inflammation of your gums? Remove the plaque, right? Floss, brush, go every six months for your dental cleaning, right? Because you don't want this situation to happen. And you don't want it to get so extreme that they have to go in and surgically, right, remove um, plaque from the teeth. Because it's gone so far down into the gums that you can't reach it with the normal methods. Trench mouth, whole different story. The name, it, it kind of implies, you know, when we really saw this happening is when individuals were literally stuck in the trenches during war, right? Uh, they didn't obviously exercise good proper hygiene, right? You're more worried about if you're going to die than <laughs> brushing your teeth, unfortunately. And you're probably exposed to things you wouldn't normally be exposed to, right? We don't live in tunnels in the dirt normally, right? Um, so there are some bacteria they have linked to um, causing this severe infection in the gums, um, although it's not considered um, contagious. 
And the contributing factors with this is, again, exposure to the microbes and being under conditions in which it fosters the growth of these microbes. So most of us are not at risk, right? We're not living in trenches, right? We're not malnourished. We're not stressed, and which puts a serious burden on our immune system, right? You see this in, for people living in appalling life conditions, right? You see this type of infection. So this is very rare in developing countries, right? Um, you're not, you're not going to um, really see this type of infection. Make sense? Okay. So it all relates back to good dental hygiene, right, uh, which needs to start early, too, with the little ones. As soon as those teeth start touching, they got to floss, right? Um, and if you have a bad experience at the dentist like I did, just find another dentist, right? Don't go years without going. And if you are pregnant or decide to become pregnant, you definitely need to meet with your dentist um, because your children will steal nutrients from your teeth. Um, and so you may need um, extra treatment. There's sealants they could put on your teeth to help you, and there's extra vitamins you can take. So my teeth got weakened by my son because I didn't know better. Um, so I always joke with him. I'm like, it's your fault. Mommy has a gold tooth like a pirate, right? <laughs> I bit down one day and crack. <laughs> it was not pleasant. That was my first root, my first root canal, right? Um, these things can be avoided, right? And I highly suggest avoiding, right, um, running into that. So this next bad guy that we're going to talk about, uh, Helicobacter pylori, um, can infect the uh, stomach. And, and, and it's because this one has a rare ability um, that most microbes don't have. So um, this guy is a... I think it's a spirillium, but you can see it has flagella, right? So this baby can swim. So when it gets into the stomach, right, it can swim right through that thick mucus layer that we produce to protect our stomach from eating itself. And it also can swim, of course, through the contents of the stomach. Most bacteria, though, are killed in our stomach by what product our stomach produces? Hydrochloric acid, right? That is a very, very strong acid. Right, trust me, you don't you don't want to mess with that one. You'll burn yourself for sure. Okay, your stomach purposely produces this to help in protein digestion, but to protect your stomach, you put produce an extremely thick layer of mucus in the stomach to protect yourself. So, how is it this guy can swim right through that acid? It produces an enzyme. The enzyme is called urease because it breaks down urea and it produces what? Ammonia. What's ammonia? No, it's not an acid. It's a base. And what happens when you put an acid in a base? They neutralize each other. You get a salt in water. So this guy produces this protective zone around him of ammonia, of a base, to keep the acid from getting at him and destroying it. Where does the urea come from? Reproduce urea, it's one of the things that makes your pee smelly. What do we digest in our stomach? Protein. It's a byproduct of protein digestion. So it's readily available in the stomach, right? <laughs> We're doing protein digestion. We're actually giving him urea, which because he has this enzyme, he can break it down produce the ammonia and protect himself from the most damaging substance we produce in our stomach and our bodies in general, hydrochloric acid. Make sense? So this guy has been linked to gastric ulcers. Um, you know, at one time they thought, you know, stress or other factors, and those can be contributing factors, right? But some, for some individuals it actually is a bacterial infection. So what's the good news with that? That we found there's actually a bacteria that can attack the lining of the stomach. We, we can treat with antibiotics. Yeah, we can treat with antibiotics. Um, the really scary thing is, is again, 
it will swim right through that mucus layer and it will damage the cells lining the stomach, including the ones that produce the mucus. You know, we get inflammation into that area. We've got our, our body responding. But we've got destruction to that protective layer so that we actually will start eating our, our own stomach, right? Our own stomach acids can, if left untreated, poke a hole right through the stomach. It takes a long time, and I don't know anybody that'd be crazy enough to go in that much pain for that long, right? Because you have three layers of muscle for your stomach, right? It's a pretty serious, squishy bag, right? Um, but it is it has happened. It is possible, right? Um, definitely. Most, most people are in, so uncomfortable, they <laughs> definitely go seek medical help, right? So we can test for this. Um, and because of the destruction of cells, whenever we have destruction of our own cells or disruption to the normal functioning, there is even the potential of cancer. And they found that um, only a small percentage, right, will actually develop cancer from these types of infections. But it can happen. It's one of the other things um, that can happen. Only, um, but uh, more than 90% of the individuals with stomach cancers are infected with Helicobacter pylori, right? So whether it was contributing to the cause or having cancer predisposes you potentially to this type of infection probably is what the case is for that. Um, and, and that's another thing too, um, oral cancer, right? One of the things that a dentist can help catch it in the early signs, right, if you go for your routine cleaning as opposed to, you know, um, when it's too late. Why is um, herpes simplex virus type 1, what, uh, explain why it can be easily spread from person to person. So this is a virus, right? Herpes simplex virus, it, it causes what we typically refer to as cold sores, right? And you can get herpes in the genital region as well, right? It's usually type 2. Um, so there's two different viruses. They're very similar. The bad news with this is if you, get, if you get a cold sore, right, and the sore goes away, is the virus gone? No. Once infected, always infected with herpes viruses. So what was one that we talked about with your skin that was in the herpes family that even if you get vaccinated, you have that virus for life? Varicella, chickenpox, right? It's in the herpes family. It's a DNA virus. It incorporates into your chromosome. So once you have it, you have the potential of whenever your immune system can't keep it under control of it re-erupting, right? So when do you see people walking around with cold sores? It's coming up. It's called finals. Because what do you not do during finals that you should do that puts your immune system at risk? You don't sleep enough. You don't eat properly, right? You eat out of things like vending machines. Not a good choice, right? And one other really bad contributing factor to immune function, stress. Stress is actually number one, right? The stress, the poor eating habits, the lack of sleep, right? I always see every semester during finals somebody walking around with a cold sore. Every semester, right? Um, so when you don't have that cold sore anymore, though, right? It's gone away, right? Finals are over. Summer has started. We're all happy, right? We're going to the beach, we're hanging out with our friends, we're kissing all kinds of people, right? Can that be transmitted when you don't have a cold sore? Your saliva is infectious even when you don't have a cold sore. Which is why cold sores are very prominent in our in our culture, right? Because you, aseptim, aseptomatic, which means if you're not showing any symptoms, you don't have a cold sore, you can still spread the virus via saliva, right? Swap and spit, right?
Kissing booths, not a good idea. Make sense? Okay. You can get either type of herpes virus, right? This um, in either place, right? Genital or on your mouth, depending on what you do. I don't have to elaborate on that, right? You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay. All right. It's not a sex ed class, right? Thank goodness. I don't think I can handle it. <laughs> Mostly because, no offense to you guys, whenever I would try to teach the sexually transmitted diseases, which you guys remember, you got to do the, the connect assignment for that. I'm not going to test you on it. And I'm not really going to talk about it in class. People start telling me about their sexually transmitted disease. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> I, I have to say that I'm glad I'm the age I am and I don't have to worry about those things. I'm in a monogamous relationship. Yesterday was my third year anniversary, actually, of my wedding. Uh, my second marriage, but you know, hey, sometimes we make mistakes in the beginning. <laughs> right? um, but that doesn't mean that, too, that I don't have anything to worry about, right? I, I need to make sure that he doesn't do anything he's not supposed to and bring it back to me, which he doesn't. At least I hope he doesn't, <laughs> right? That's the scary thing about, you know, the world that we live in, but it's always been like that, right? The good news now is that there's more education out there, right? And that's the most powerful thing that you guys can do. And uh, one of my nieces, she is actually um, a nurse practitioner now. And she has a younger sister. And when she was in nursing school, she brought home her microbiology book, right, with all those nasty pictures, right? And she said, this is why you leave boys alone. You don't want any of this, right? <laughs> and when I was in college, because I, I went to a, a away college and we lived in the dormitory, you were required to go to a workshop on sexually transmitted diseases. Right? My, my, the school I went to was very responsible when it came to that, and that was great. Um, and, and the guy who taught it was, was amazing. He never got embarrassed. You know, you couldn't embarrass this man. He could talk about anything related to sex and sexually transmitted disease, and it just did not face him in the least. And he was talking about one of them about how um, it'll form a crust on the tip of the penis so that when you go to urinate, it, you get what's referred to as split stream. Um, and so, this, you know, it would spray everywhere, right? And he said the other thing that could happen is semen can dry the tip of the penis if you don't wipe it off, right? And that can cause the same effect where you get split stream. So there was a guy in the back. <laughs> After he said, you know, or semen could dry there and this could happen, let out the biggest sigh <laughs> of relief <laughs> that I ever, because everyone turns around and looks at him, right? Clearly he had experienced the split stream. <laughs> so, um, yeah, these are important things, right? And sometimes for some individuals it's difficult to talk about, right? Um, but uh, don't make that the reason that you don't um, educate yourself or share what you know with others that you care about, right? Because um, it is important. All right, so that's it for my sexually transmitted. I'm done. I'm probably beat red. I'm moving on. Okay. Okay. Um, so we, we mentioned mumps earlier. Why did we talk about mumps earlier? Yeah, it's in the MMR, which is the measles, mumps, and rubella uh, vaccination. Where's Bridget this morning? <laughs> Bridget's the other class. Never mind. <laughs> I was like, where is she? We were talking about mumps in that class, too. Um, so... There is the potential that we could eradicate this um, infection. Uh, so why? We, one, we have, we just said it. We have a vaccine. So we could prevent, right, infection. That's great, right? How is it that we get rid of smallpox? So we, we had a vaccine, an effective vaccine we have, excuse me, not had, have, effective smallpox vaccine, right? So we have a vaccine for mumps, right? So that's number one. 
What else do we need to be able to do as far as infection goes if we want to eradicate it? So we got to vaccinate everybody, right? How else is disease spread? Contact, right? So this one, what's the mode of transmission? Yeah, spit respiratory droplets, right, um, in your saliva. Um, but also your saliva goes into your respiratory droplets. So you, you want to maintain um, isolation from individuals that have infection, right? As far as we know, this is human only. This is good news, right? Because then we have one population to work with, humans, which is a pretty large population, mind you. <laughs> But it's still easier than will we ever see eradication of rabies. We have a vaccine. Come on. That means we can eradicate it, right? Now, where do you get rabies? Animals, other than humans, carry it, right? In Louisiana, who are you staying away from? Raccoons. Number one carriers of rabies in Louisiana. Don't mess with them at all, right? If it's out during the day and it's approaching you, that's not normal behavior. Call animal control immediately, right? So it's just not possible to vaccinate the whole wild animal population, right? It's just not possible. Um, when we're dealing with that many and not a very accessible population, right? I don't know, that, you know. One, if it's coming up to you already, it probably already has rabies, right? Uh, I don't think the raccoons are going to be lining up outside doctor's offices. I want my rabies vaccine, right? It's not going to happen, right? But we can do that with humans, can't we, right? We have a much better potential of, of eradicating um, something if it's human only, right? Um, and, and it appears to be human only, right? So we're the only transmitters of this virus. There appears to be only a single serotype, which means there aren't any you know, differences, different strains or anything like that out there of this particular virus. Uh, the, there's a long incubation period, though, 15 to 20 days. That's not in our favor, right? So what does that mean, incubation period? Yeah, before the person has symptoms, they're infected and can spread the infection. So that makes it really hard for isolating them, right? As we said, it's in the MMR vaccine. It is the second M, measles, mumps, and rubella, which is also known as German measles. Um, so no effective antiviral treatment, but the good news is most people recover very easily from this. And at one time before vaccination, it was very prevalent for people to have mumps. Um, and there's a lot of older people that are naturally immune because they had it when they were a kid. Um, the most common um, organ that's our, our gland that's affected um, is the one right here. And so you'll notice this is a little bit different picture than the one in your book. I like this one better. Can you see the swelling he's experiencing on this side? It's unmistakable in this picture, right? Um, what, what gland is that? It's the parotid salivatory gland, right? It's the saliva gland. Again, hence why, you know, the saliva is infectious. It can spread, though, throughout the body. Um, and for some reason, another area where there's a lot of receptors for this virus, other than the salivatory glands, is the testicles, of all things. Um, so, uh, one of, I, I'm a huge Kevin Costner fan. One of my, one of his movies, The Postman. Anyone ever see that? I know, I'm old. Um, it's okay. Uh, he, he, uh, it's, it's po post-apocalyptic times, you know, right? Society has fallen apart and he finds, um, some mailbag and, uh, decides that he's, he's going to become a postman in this post-apocalyptic world. And, um, it's basically his end to communities to, you know, get food and housing and then he collects letters and then he goes someplace else. And one of the stops in the movie, um, a woman wants, wants him to sleep with her so she can have a baby. And the reason that she gives uh, for that is that her husband cannot impregnate her because he had the mumps 
and affected his testicles and made him infertile. And I was like, oh, yay! An actual, like, real, like, use of science that's not inaccurate, right? So many times in movies and in TV shows, sometimes they screw up the science, right? And that really couldn't happen. This really could happen, right? Mumps really could make someone potentially sterile. I was happy, right? Unlike other times when I'm screaming at the TV. That can't happen! <laughs> they got the science wrong! They really upset me in the show Scorpion. I actually even stopped watching it. Because they did something wrong. <laughs> they made something happen in a half an hour show that won't happen in a half an hour. The science was... was somewhat correct, but the time frame was wrong. So this is a good immunology re review for you guys. So if you get bit by a snake, right, could you give the venom to a guinea pig and get it to produce antibodies and take those antibodies and then give it to the person who got bit by the snake? Yeah, you could, but the, the, the dude, the dude got, that got bit by the snake is dead. By the time that guinea pig produces the antibodies, that person is dead. Because how long would it take that guinea pig to produce those antibodies? One to two weeks. Seven to 14 days. Right? Somehow, hours later, they were able to take the blood from the guinea pig and give it to the guy and save him. And of course, it was all elaborate. They broke into this place to get the snake, to get the venom, to give it to the guinea pig. And if they broke into a place where they keep venomous snakes, y'all, they should have just broke into the medicine cabinet there because they keep anti-venom on hand, right? Again, I was impressed with the science, right, that they brought to light that that's how antibodies are made, right? But there's no way you could do it in the time frame they did it in the show. You see my upset with that? Okay. So, um, it's an important point, right? Because if you get that flu vaccine, you can't walk out the door and go, okay, I'm protected, right? you got to wait for that immune system response to be protected. Okay, so um, lots of bacteria can cause infections of our lower intestinal um, system. So we're talking about small intestine, large intestine mainly. Um, cholera caused by Vibrio cholera, uh, Campylobacter. Bacteriosis um, caused by uh, Campylobacter juni junium. Um, several Enterobacter, um, so this is a grouping of bacteria that exist in the gut of warm blooded mammals. So Shigellosis is caused by several Shigella species of bacteria. When someone is said to have what's called gastroenteritis, it's usually um, a pathogenic strain of. Uh, e. coli, Ericea coli, uh, and then salmonellaosis is, of course, um, several strains of salmonella, um, several species of salmonella can cause um, this infection. Um, so what does it mean when we say gastroenteritis? It means that someone has an inflammation, right, because we're saying itis, right, so we have an acute inflammation, some type of infection happening either the stomach or the stomach in the intestines. So this syndrome, and we'll say syndrome because we're dealing with symptoms here, right? A person has these symptoms. And then if we get at the cause, then we can say, oh, he has salmonella or um, shigella or something else. But individuals that have an infection, um, they'll experience nausea, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and, of course, abdominal pain. Dysentery, much worse than just gastroenteritis. This is characterized by crampy abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. And blood in, in the stool is not a good sign, right? It indicates destruction to cells, um, to the intestines itself, right? And unfortunately, lots of pathogens out there can cause destruction to the cells of our intestines, right? And mainly they do that by producing what? Toxins, right? It's usually toxins um, that they produce. 
So what's the most common source of bacterial pathogens for our intestines? What do you want to avoid? So they're in our intestines, so they're shed in our feces, right? So we all know not to eat poo, right? Very simply, usually when a person ingests food or drinking water that's been contaminated with animal or human feces, right? And unfortunately, that can happen. This is referred to as the fecal-oral route of infection or you ingest poop. The bad news is, is that microscopic amounts of feces contain microorganisms that you can't see that could make you sick, which is why every single place that you go where you can eat food, restaurants, cafes, coffee shops, what does it say in the restroom? Employees, employees must wash hands before returning back to work right, so they don't contaminate you or your food and therefore you. So how do bacterial pathogens cause diarrheal disease, right? How do we end up with this infection in our intestines? Number one for all infections, and especially in this case, because if it doesn't attach, it's just going to get pushed out the system, right? In one end, out the other. Most often, it's papillae, right? So those protein appendages they use to specifically attach to our epithelial cells of our intestines. So they get stuck, right? They don't get washed away with the mucus. They stick to us. Uh, but other uh, adhesion molecules can be used by different organisms um, that really make that attachment really strong, very intimate. They're not going anywhere. Some of them will even then have secretion systems, right, where they're attaching and they're secreting stuff that causes changes in our cells that make it even easier for the bacteria to attach. So some pathogenic strains of E. coli, for instance, release, they attach by the papillae, and then they release substances that actually... Um, cause a change in the actin filaments that create the microvilli that we have in our small intestine and turn them into these little pedestals that the bacteria can attach to. Okay. So they actually change our protein structure, our actin filaments within our cells and make it such that it's much easier for additional bacteria of that species to attach. So Number one, it's about attachment, right? Get, having those papillae stick to it so they don't get washed out the system by the mucus and the constant um, peristalsis that happens in the intestinal tract. The number two thing they typically do and why they're bad news and why we end up with diarrhea is that they produce toxins. And there's two main groups of the types of toxins that these types of pathogens that in, infect the intestines can do. So Vibrio cholera is an example of one where its toxins increase secretions of water and electrolytes in our intestines, right? So instead of absorbing water, we're putting water into the intestines and therefore filling up the system so then it flushes out, right? And we end up with diarrhea, with loose stool. Why would it want to do that? Because think about this, right? Is it, Are some of them going to get washed out in this process as well? Yeah. But if you've ever experienced diarrhea, right? When you got to go, you got to go. Right? It's like serious. So think about an animal that doesn't have the smarts that we have that it was like, okay, I have to go to a restroom, not just go poop right where I am right now. Right? So that actually aids in the spread of this, right? The fact that it causes this type of diarrhea where the person has just got to go, it's pulled up. You've got to go right then, right? An animal will go where that happens. They're not going to do it in a preferential spot. So then that puts it in the environment and exposes more 
to that pathogen and aids in the spread of it. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. So the other one, which of course is not better, it's worse, right? These toxins cause cell death. Uh, a lot of times they halt um, protein synthesis in our cells and cause our cells to die. So shigella dysentery, right? The reason why it's dysentery, you get that bloody diarrhea because you're getting cell destruction, right? Your cells are dying because of the toxins that this guy produces. Others even go a third step, and they alter our cells. So some use type 3 secretion systems to deliver molecules into the intestinal epithelium. And so this was the example that I talked about a moment ago where they're actually changing right, the structure of our cells so that um, it creates a platform or a pedestal for the E. coli to attach to. They don't stop there. Some of them are like, you know, I don't like being outside the cell. I want in. I want in, right? So they, again, deliver molecules that aid in the ability of the bacteria to gain entry into the cells. So Shigella species do this, right? They actually can invade into the cell cytoplasm, but they don't even stop there, right? So they've gotten in, right? They're not even happy with that. They continue to run through our cells. So I have a picture I want to go to. Cholera, as you can see, not really a problem in the United States for the most part, but um, shellfish and contaminated waters can be a real issue for us, so especially in Louisiana. When you go to places like Acme Oyster House, they have warnings about eating raw shellfish, right, um, that it could contain um, pathogens. And you can see that back in 2006, um, right, they had four cases. And they even have the note, right, Louisiana was the focus of a cholera infection associated with contam consumption of contaminated shellfish harvested in local waters, right? So there was a contamination issue there. The, the um, I eat raw oysters, right, um, you run the risk, right? But you also know, like, if you get sick, that maybe that might have been the cause and you can alert medical professionals because of that. But we also, you know, have strict regulation on the industry because of this, right? We don't want people to get sick. And I have to say, it's probably one of the better regulated food industries <laughs> as opposed to some of the others. <laughs> we do a good job in Louisiana. Uh, fishermen complain, but I, I think that, you know, it's important. We don't want to get sick. Uh, so as you can see, like these are some past numbers, right? Um, we even had zero cases in the United States in uh, 2014. Um, there was a problem, what year was it? Uh, a lot of relief work, traveling uh, for disasters. Um, so 16 uh, were associated to travel. So these people didn't get these in cholera here, right? They traveled and came back with it. Right, um, and so that's one of the things that we want to work, that we need to take into consideration when we travel. Uh, so where's, oh, there's, there's Shigella. Uh, so this guy can actually cause M cells to preferentially um, take it up. It can uh, get gobbled up by our macrophages, but it can escape macrophages, right? So even though we gobble it up, we don't destroy it. Some of them even escape. And... When they're in our cells, they can attach to our actin filaments in our cells and use them to slingshot themselves from cell to cell. Right? Evil bacteria. Just evil. Right? And then they produce, some of them produce, um, where they get the name, they produce a toxin known as the shiga toxin. As I said, it can be extremely disruptive um, to our cells. So let's see. Uh, so there's a strain of E. coli that has acquired that toxin from Shigella called the Shiga toxin. And so we have serious problems when we have um, contamination with that strain as well. Um, this is some of the different um, times, right, where we've had, and they keep track of this, the CDC keeps track of it, right? So these are um, the outbreaks 
um, that happened in 2006. In 2012, And again, with salmonella and shigellulosis, and with E. coli 0157, this sugar toxin producing strain, a lot of times they're linked to food contaminations, right? Um, and so that's what you'll see in a lot of the reports. So what are, what are what what measures do we have for protecting ourselves against the viruses that cause hepatitis A, B, and C? We have a vaccine. Against all of them? No. no, just A and B, not C. And there are other hepatitises, but we don't have uh, vaccines against them. What's the significance of if they do a test and a person has hepatitis B virus or antibodies in their blood? They have the infection or, or have had the infection, right? If they have the antigen, they have the infection. If they have antibodies, they had the infection or have it. Depends on where you're at. Why is that important? So what? Well, anybody want hepatitis? No. Okay. Are you going to go to the doctor and be like, I have hepatitis? Not in the early stages, right? The only way to really detect something like this, because think about it, it's your liver that's affected. Unless you've gotten really serious damage and inflammation going on, then you'll be jaundiced, right? But if we can detect these things earlier with blood tests, then we can, we can treat and, uh, and effectively help individuals earlier, right? This is all about early detection and treatment and preventing, of course, the spread to other individuals. And then the really good news, right, with hepatitis B now is that we routinely vaccinate everyone against this. At one time, we used to not vaccinate everyone. Now, infants are vaccinated against hepatitis B. The bad news with hepatitis C is we don't have a vaccine. So, uh, Giardius... Uh, cryptosporidosis, cyclosporidosis, and amoebiosis. These are all caused by, what's the title of the slide? Protozoa, right? These are protozoal diseases. Uh, what do you really have to worry about with these types of diseases? How are you going to get this? What's the similar about the epidemiology here? Water. Contaminated water is what you want to avoid, right? Contaminated water. So two seconds. Anyone ever hear of Typhoid Mary? Typhoid Mary back in the 1930s worked as a cook. She was an immigrant from um, Ireland. She had salmonella, uh, but she didn't have an active infection. She became a carrier because it traveled up the bile duct and was in her gallbladder and multiplying there. So each time she she excreted bile into her intestines. She also excreted salmonella typhi. She worked as a cook. She got a whole bunch of people sick, and they traced it back to her. Right? But she wasn't actively sick. They didn't know what she was doing or not doing. So they quarantined her. Back then, y'all, they put her in prison. Then they let her out. And then she went back working as a cook in a maternity ward of all places. And guess what? Got a whole bunch of people sick. When they when she died in prison, they autopsied her, found salmonella in her gallbladder, and cremated her. What could they have done to help this woman and everyone else? You can't actually cure this with antibiotics, because remember you can't get to the in the gallbladder. The way they cure the carrier state of this is they actually remove the gallbladder. Back then, they didn't do that type of stuff, right? But they could have helped her when she was still alive and a whole bunch of other people. They taught her one very important thing. If it's nothing you get out of this class, I hope it's this very important thing. Wash your damn hands. <laughs> right? Wash your hands. The other thing is, is, is they probably could have trained her to do something else, right? Go get a job doing something else other than cooking people's food, right? Because clearly you don't know proper hygiene. 
All right. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Don't forget to submit your work.